But back to my point about differences in the uh, political error is that in the very first episode, uh, Grandpa is uh, at the PTA meeting and the mo moms are all complaining about this game called Sockball, which basically sounds like dodgeball, where you throw a, throw a ball at a kid and if it hits him, then you know the kids have been falling down and getting hurt. And the moms are like, oh, it can't happen. We can't have these kids getting hurt because, you know, they're throwing balls at each other. And so uh, grandpa stands up and he's like, what do we want? We want to, we want these kids to turn into cream puffs. We want them to start playing sissy games, you know, which uh, again is now something you would never hear on uh, TV. Yeah. <laughs> also, there's an episode in, in a later season where the middle kid and the older kid had this like fight over the same girl it, it's a misunderstanding of course it's that episode it's that kind of thing where she thinks she's going to talk to one brother uh but the younger son thinks it's him and blah 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 it's this whole thing anyway so they start like the younger kid jumps the older kid over the the you know to prove he's worth going out with the older or going out with the girl, blah, blah, blah. So the whole episode is basically like, you know, Steve, Fred McMurray, the father, uh, him trying to like say, hey, we can talk this out. We can, you know, a little more diplomacy going on. And at the same time, we got the grandfather who's like, let's just give them some boxing gloves and they can, you know, they can, they'll solve the, They'll answer this problem for themselves. Let's just you give know? them some hockey sticks. <laughs> Exactly. <laughs> At one point, he says, uh, you know, if we don't let these kids fight it out, they're going to be sissified, mealy mouth, whimpering pussyfooters. You know, I'm just like, <laughs> wow. OK, which, of course, you know, like you go to the 80s, you jump to the 80s or even 90s. You look at something like Full House, right? where the whole episode is just them like, now we just need to talk this out. We can't have you girls fighting with each other. You know, it's like quite the different thing. Nobody's taking the the side of like, yeah. nah, just let them beat it out of each other. It'll be fine. Give us some hockey sticks and put a fence around them and we'll see who's still living when we open the door. Right, exactly, exactly. You know though, but I think too that this is another thing that we can talk about as far as what the 60s were, right? You have the you have this generational gap, right? Which is a big thing that's happening in the 60s. You have these grandfathers, these fathers yep. of these, you know, mostly grandfathers, right. who are, you know, grew up in the in the the Great Depression. Right. You know, these guys were, hit the beaches in Normandy. Yeah, exactly. Who were in World War II, who were, you know, these guys who were not pussyfooting around who were not right. you know who were in it and they uh and yeah. uh you know and then you had this like 1960s generation where we're like hey let's just you know let's cool it man and like everything's chill we can we're gonna talk this out it's all gonna be all right so you know it's another interesting dynamic that you know exists here in the 60s which is again something we've sort of seen playing out in star trek you know, where you have, sometimes you've got these people in Starfleet who are like, uh, you know, hey, let's just rush in and kill the Klingons or the Romulans or, you know, whatever. It was like the episode with the Romulans where you had the one navigator guy who's right. like, no, let's just blow them out of the sky. And then you've got Kirk who's like, well, let's see what happens here, you know. <laughs> so uh, that's interesting. Anyway, my three sons, uh, I think I wrote out a couple of specific jokes. So that first episode that I was telling you about, about grandpa going to the PTA meeting, well, he shows up to bring one of the kids a sack lunch and uh, then starts helping out with the with the vaudeville that they're doing in their drama class. So then he starts coming to all the rehearsals and uh, which is embarrassing the middle son and is also embarrassing him in front of like this girl that he likes. And then I can't remember what was happening with the older son. Oh, he's talking to people about going to college and going to state and while he's there, you know, grandfather's like, oh, trying to get yourself a good track star, huh? <laughs> I know how these things work. And so, like, the grandpa's embarrassing all of the kids. And then by the end of the episode, you know, they find out that, gee, actually, grandfather's been doing a lot of help. You know, thanks a lot, grandpa, for being there. You know, the director of the vaudeville's like, oh, really glad your grandpa was there to show us how to do these things. And, you know, the oldest son ends up getting into state and saying, like, uh, you know, your grandfather, we're not going to, you know, 
I bring you into the school just because of what your grandpa says or not bring you into the school. You know, so it's like, that's how the episode ends with like everything turning out okay. And gee, thanks grandpa. And uh, my note after that was, this is what's beating Star Trek in the ratings. <laughs> the only other thing worth mentioning is, is that during season one, they were sort of playing with the conventions of what a sitcom is. Whereas uh, in later seasons, they didn't. It was just a regular old boring sitcom. But in the first seasons, there was like this episode where they were getting ready in the morning and it was coinciding with a rocket launch. And like as things went wrong in the rocket launch, things went wrong in the kitchen. And when things went right, then, you know, everybody was cl getting their way out the door as they were heading off towards school. So that was kind of cool, except as I said... After season one, it sort of all went out the window and just became a regular old boring sitcom. Though, to be fair, like, I mean, I know we had some sitcoms on the radio and we had our Leave it to Beavers and our Dream of Genies and stuff. So, you know, some of these sitcoms that we look at and we're like, well, that's a little hacky. You know, those jokes aren't really funny. To be fair, we've had, you know, 40, 50 years of sitcoms to, you yeah. know, to get the jokes out. And you're like, oh, okay. I get it. I understand how this works now. Go ahead. I got, I got an idea. So one of the things that you see for the shows like this that start in the late 50s, you know, you basically have straight up nuclear families. Leave it to Beaver, make room for Daddy, Father's Knows Best, Ozzie and Harriet, right? Right. And then they begin to fiddle with the formula a little bit, right? So something like the Andy Griffith show starts with, you know, you got Andy, Opie, and Aunt B. And you're right. like, okay, so where's the mother? And they never really kind of explain it to you. You know, he's a widower, you know, kind of a thing. And families, you know, have this kind of unconventional, but, you know, conventional in the sense that something weird is going on. Um, you know, you, it's a the mother has died, the father has died, and they've got some, you know, surrogate, like my three sons, right? Where's the mother? You're not quite sure. At first, you've got the mother's father. Well, that's a that's a clear, you know, normal kind of a thing, right? Yeah. If you were to have a death in the family. And then by the late 60s, you're getting things like the Brady Bunch. Now we've got some divorces and some remarriages, and we've got a mixed family, or you've got family affair in which you've got this uncle and the the in the beginning they explained that like the parents all you know died in a plane crash or something, and the kids, Buffy and Jody, come to live with their swinging, sophisticated uncle who you know, very quickly becomes very domesticated. Yeah. And uh, but you've got like this now this weird family, right? Uncle and the niece and nephew, and like their manservant. <laughs> yes. <laughs> and they do other things that, that, that play with the family. So you'll have things like the Munsters or the Adams family in which you're taking the formula. Everyone's still there, but they're monsters. And so you get these, uh, this, this progression from kind of straight up nuclear family, white picket fence to, you know, situations where there's divorce and mixed families and uh, all kinds of weird stuff going on in the sense of like the fifties. Right. Right. So a couple things to, uh, that you've actually teed me up for kind of perfectly on that. The first one is, is that, uh, <clears throat> you know, you're talking about the formula and how quickly he becomes domesticated and blah, blah, blah. I was explaining to Jamie the other night who had no idea, not only what the show was, but who these people were, I was explaining uh, Silver Spoons, right? And she's like, well, what was the premise of the story? I'm like, well, first you got Ricky Schroeder. And she's like, who? And I'm like, we'll just, <laughs> we're going to move on. We're going to move on. And I go, it's basically the idea that you've got this kid who's, you know, gone to boarding school. He's this like uptight, you know, like kid who goes to live with his father who's rich and who never grew up. You know, he's got video games in the house. He's got a train that runs through the house. You know, he never, and so you have, you know, these two who are constantly fighting each other by the kid who's like in boarding school is trying to, you know, is trying to, the whole idea is, is like to each teach, each, right. teach each other, right? So, uh, but, but they're so switching goes, with their role, so. Yeah, exactly. In this case, they're switching the roles, exactly. So, 
um, she's like, well, do they ever like come to see eye to eye? And I go, babe, if they do that, the show's over. Like, you know, <laughs> the show ran for three seasons and then it was over because they're like, how long can we carry this on before, even though at the end of the episode, they understand where each other's coming from, <laughs> you know, to then come back next week and be like, gee, dad, why are you still playing on the pinball machine? You know? <laughs> So that was one thing I was thinking of. Uh, the, the second one, that there was an episode. So, so, you know, like I said, there was that three episode arc at the beginning of season six, or seven, where they adopt the kid, Ernie. And so they couldn't, at first they couldn't adopt the kid. They could only like take him in as a foster kid, but they couldn't adopt him because there was no mother figure in the house. And so like, it became this thing of like, oh my gosh, we don't have a mom. Like they, the, 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 the adoption services wanted to make sure that there was a woman's presence in the home. And so then they bring in the adoption lady and they meet at the house. And so then at the house, they hear how, you know, uncle Charlie is, you know, treating the kids and make, you know, telling them they, Just where everything is. Hockey sticks. <laughs> exactly. Well, not that, <laughs> not that. It's like, you know, showing him how to sew buttons onto their clothes and how they, you know, he was cooking dinner and blah, blah, blah. <laughs> so he, they get the judge to make an ex exception by basically saying that he's like the woman in the house. Right. So, uh, yeah, I mean, just a crazy thing that would, again, only yeah, happen like, in the 60s. And he would wear an apron in the show. Yeah. And, yeah, well, he uh, wore an apron almost the entire episode. Yeah. Yeah. Crazy. All right. Well, we've talked enough about my three sons. Uh, again, there are. Uh, it's actually super easy to find my three sons episodes on uh, YouTube. So if you want to go check them out, I advise you to go over there. Uh, now, a lot more difficult to find on YouTube are uh, episodes of Mission Impossible. Luckily for me, uh, I, I have Amazon uh, Prime, so I was able to watch some on there. Uh, or was it Netflix? I think it was, maybe it was Netflix that it was on. But so uh, I watched a few episodes of uh, Mission Impossible. That was fun. Um, now, interestingly enough, the first season, which uh, of course is really, I really like cling, clung, clinged on to the first season of the show because these were the episodes that were being filmed at the same time as Star Trek. So I thought there'd be a little more crossover there. I watched two episodes, uh, really great episodes, kind of formulaic, but at least it makes it easy to explain to you folks what uh, Mission Impossible was before uh, Tom Cruise started uh, hanging onto airplanes or flying off of mountains in the movies. Uh, now, most people know the leader of, as uh, Jim Phelps, played by Peter Graves, right? So that's how everybody remembers the uh, leader of the IMF. But season one actually had a fellow by the name of Dan Briggs, who was played by Stephen Hill. Now, Stephen Hill, you may know from Law and Order because uh, a million years ago, at the beginning of Law and Order, back when, you know, it was uh, Briscoe and, uh, that was Chris, Not Chris Knott's character name, I don't remember now. Anyway, back then, uh, the DA, the head DA at that time, was uh, played by an older man named St uh, whose name was Stephen Hill. So uh, it's funny because, of course, I only know him as this like old guy who basically over the years just kept looking more and more unhealthy on uh, Law and Order. But he was the original IMF leader on on Mission Impossible, which is fun. Now, of course, you might be wondering what uh, IMF stands for. It stands for the uh, Impossible Mission Force. Dun 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 dun. <laughs> now, uh, the reason that Stephen Hill left uh, Mission Impossible the first year was because uh, he was an Orthodox Jew. And so because of that, he had to leave on Fridays at 4 p.m. and be home before sundown. So uh, he was not available for shoots Friday nights and Saturdays, which, of course, obviously, you know, we you hear how much we talk about how much Star Six Trek goes days, over all yeah. the time. Yeah, so uh, so that caused a real problem. And it was funny because he even, you know, when he signed the contract, was like, you know, just so you know, this is the thing. And all the producers are like, yeah, sure, it's not going to be a problem until it became a problem. So that, uh, that really sucks for him. And so then uh, Peter Graves then took over and was the leader of the IMF. Now, Martin uh, Landau, 
who we uh, all know from uh, many years of movies. Although I realize that Martin Landau has never been in any kind of Star Trek. So isn't that interesting? With all his like genre films and everything else that he's done. Uh, even playing Bella Lugosi in uh, uh, that Tim Burton movie. With the Angora sweaters. Plan 9 from Outer Space. That movie. You know, he plays Bella Lugosi in that movie. But uh, but no, Martin Landau's ever been in Star Trek, which is interesting. Even all the movies and stuff. But uh, Landau was billed as a special guest star during the first season. He had been cast as a guest star for the pilot with the understanding that he would make uh, one to four or five more uh, rotating guest star agents. Because uh, it's weird, and I think that they did this all along, is, is that depending on the mission and the plan that they laid out every episode would depend how many of the IMF agents they would need. And so, you know, sometimes you'd need four, sometimes you'd need two, and then who it was depended on their special skills that they had for uh, every mission. But uh, Landau ended up being used more and more uh, in more and more episodes, but every time got labeled as a guest star. So that was funny. You know, if we think about Bond, which again, we'll be talking about in a couple of weeks, right? There, everybody likes James Bond. Everybody loves James Bond. That was just the big thing of the 60s, Bond, Bond, Bond. So the more and more spy stuff that we could get on TV, the better, you know? And so we have a kind of James Bond on TV with this show, wouldn't you say? I mean, you know, we got the spy stuff. We got, you know, fake passports and, you know... Yeah ghoulish gadgets and disguises and really cool like mod music you know that's happening in the uh in the background as well so yeah you think about this and i spy with robert culp and bill, bill cosby and right. the parody version which would be uh, get smart and it you know it's kind of like the 60s couldn't get enough of the spies right and also the avengers which we'll talk about a little bit later too Steed and Peel and uh, and uh, those crazy British folks, but uh, so lots of spy stuff. Um, so there was basically the formula of the show went like this: at the beginning there was the setup, right? So this is where you know at the beginning uh, Stephen Hill or or, or or Peter Graves would uh, find the tape recorder, the tape recorder. With the mission, should you choose to accept it. And it would be uh, weird stuff. Like he goes to a drive through and he gets a burger. And in, in the bag is a tape recorder. He goes right. to the bank and he gets some, you know, withdraws some money. And in the bag is the tape recorder. Like right. he sits down to like read a magazine. And like there's just a ribbon that rolls out. And he looks down and there's the tape recorder. <laughs> yeah, and the two I saw, there was a, he goes to a, uh, like a, a metal facility that deals with metal in some way. And uh, he goes in and he finds it in a locker. And then in another episode, he uh, he parks next to a, a car, gets in the passenger side and finds the tape recorder in the, in the thing. So, yeah. So your mission, should you choose to accept it? Uh, you know, and then it would lay out like, well, this is the problem. This is what we need right. to do. Blah, blah, blah. And then uh, both times... Both times that I saw it, because it was season one, they were like, you know, basically, please disregard this, you know, this uh, tape thing, which usually got thrown into a fire of some kind, you know, or got smashed. Uh, of course, later, you know, we got the all the famous, uh, this message will self-destruct, and then it would yeah. just blow up on its own. So we'd always get the setup, and then after the setup, uh, Peter Graves or Stephen Hill would go and uh, figure out who's involved, you know, so a lot of times in season one, you know, he'd open up this portfolio and he'd start looking through all the agents and sometimes he'd pass or sometimes he'd throw one on a coffee table and be like, we're going with this guy this week and this guy. No, not her. Oh, but her this week. We're going to use her. So that was always uh, who was involved. And then there was always a plan, you know, and so it's like, OK, we're going to go to. And, and this was funny, and I don't know, I should have checked this out in the later seasons and whatnot. Uh, I don't know what seasons you watched. But uh, wherever they were going was never a real place. Right. Yep. Yep. Like, <laughs> yeah. They so in one map, episode, and there'd be this like new place on the map. You're like, what the heck? <laughs> yeah. What is this new? Where is this place? Crazy place I'm going. Uh, one of the episodes, 
One of the episodes I watched, they were going behind the Iron Curtain, right? So they were going to, you know, uh, East Berlin or they were going to Czechoslovakia, you know, when it was part of, uh, you know, when they were all bad. And uh, and they were going to smuggle somebody out, right? But uh, the place that they went was not a real country. It was some kind of crazy name that they had. So uh, that was a thing. And then, uh, so then they create the plan and then they go and they execute the plan. And then something would go wrong with the plan. And uh, they'd have to figure out a new way to, uh, you know, to finish off the plan. Or, or, not even or, and then something would go wrong and then there'd be an additional complication. So, you know, like as the show is going along, much like Star Trek, as the show is going along, the the complications, the the conflicts continue to build, you know, until we get to, uh, you know, the final resolution where it all ends and everything is awesome. So we got that. So one of the episodes that I watched was uh, they go to basically some Central American country and uh, they were basically trying to help the, the Nationals who were the, the bad guys and then the uh, like the liberators who were the good guys. And uh, there was this big vote coming and they knew there was going to be voter fraud. So they had to go and, and the, the, the voting machines were being kept in a, uh, a police station which was being run by the, the Nationals, right? So they had to break into the police station, adjust one of the voting machines. But because of the way the voting machine was set up in a bad way, they had to uh, come back and finish it later. So on the way out of the uh, police station, what, the guy who's supposed to, who's the only person who can fix the voting machine gets shot. So that's a complication. And then we're not sure he's ever going to be able to make it to fix the voting machine. But then he tries. But as he's fixing the voting machine, like he starts to sweat, like his eyes get all like glassy and he, he's not sure if he's going to be able to see anymore. But he's got to make it back onto the stretcher so that they can take him out. It's this whole big complicated thing. Anyway, so that's kind of like how it keeps building and building and building in that episode. But funny thing about that one is that there are two, count them, two. Star Trek alums in that first was is that the, uh, and it took me a minute to get this one, but the leader of the Nationals, Mark Leonard, who we have uh, seen as a Romulan and will soon see as Sarek on Star Trek. Uh, but also the other one was, uh, who was the leader of the, the police station, the policia was also the same actor whose name I didn't write down. Cause I'm dumb. Who was also, uh, the head of Starbase 86 in Court Martial. Ah. Yeah. So both of those actors were in that episode. And then the second one that I watched, which is the one where they go behind the Iron Curtain, starred John Kolikos as the uh, as the God. head, like, right, who was the first uh, Klingon, of course, in Aaron to Mercy, one of the ones we just recently did. Also in that episode, just because I happened to look him up, Joseph Campanello was also in that episode. He was the scientist that they were trying to smuggle back over over the border. Funny thing about what happens at the beginning of this episode is he find, we find out he actually doesn't want to leave. Uh, it was his wife who wanted to leave, and so blah, blah, blah. Trouble, conflict involves. But uh, this guy's named Joseph, Joseph Campanella, who, uh, believe it or not, had to wait all the way until Star Trek Voyager to get on Star Trek. He was in the episode Author and Author. However, he was considered for the role of Kang in Day of the Dove. So close, not close. Side note on him also is that he actually just passed away this past May, like uh, the right at the beginning of May at the age of 93. So crazy. Uh, what else did you got? Uh, you got on Mission Impossible because you watched a couple of that one. I did. Uh, so owing to my inability to make sense of your text, I watched episode seven or season seven, which is like oh. 1972. <laughs> oh, goodness. So, uh, of course, Michelle Nichols was a police sergeant oh, in one neat. of the episodes. Yeah, so um, in this one, the IMF were pretending to be police to interrogate a guy. They take him into custody, and they do this special interrogation. And one of the corrupt police lieutenants is going to try to figure out what they're up to and pass it on to the syndicate. And at one point, he gets Michelle Nichols to, you know, like, read some dossiers to him. So she does. And then uh, she gets to see 1972 Nichelle Nichols. Nice. 
And what was weird about these is they were so disconnected, right? So it's like one week you're in the Caribbean with your made up country of Camagua, and we're going to break the syndicate's hold on this corrupt, you know, uh, Latin American country. And then the very next episode, um, you know, you're going to take a guy and make him think that a nuclear war has happened and that it's 28 years after the last thing he did. Oh my gosh. So you drug him in the police station, right? When he wakes up, this is the one with Michelle Nichols, drug him in the police station and then like basically put a costume on him and make him look like an old man. Oh my gosh. And convince him that it's 28 years later and the reason you're not clear on what happened is because you're a case number nine or whatever it is. Wow. And uh, and like this is your way to get him to confess about the crime he committed. <laughs> and you're like, these like are so disconnected from each other. In one sense, of course, it's the episodic television we've been talking about, right? Right. Kind of dials it up to 11. We're going to come up <laughs> with a bunch of crazy scenarios, right? Impossible missions, right? Yep. And... You know, at least in a slightly later Hawaii Five O, which especially in the seventies could be pretty episodic, they did have some established recurring, you know, villains like uh, Ho Fat, for example, the the Chinese uh, Secret Service guy. And of course, you know, there so, you're only stuck on one island. You know, you're stuck right. in Hawaii as opposed yeah. to you know the IMF or we're everywhere. Yeah. We're, you know, we're fighting crime here. We're fighting corruption there. We're fighting the, the communists here. We're yep. yeah, doing every kind of crazy thing. It's like there's no portfolio. They just do anything. And so that, that was uh, kind of odd about the show. Yeah. So you, you never know where they would be or who they'd be fighting. There was no storyline. There was no, no master villain. Yeah, I think, too, uh, with... Um... And I mean, that certainly sounds like it in that episode. But I think that that Mission Impossible does get a little weird from, you know, like in later seasons. It allows itself to be almost more like, why? Anyway. Um, but yeah, I think that becomes almost like a more Avenger style, you know, where there's like these almost supernatural, you know, things that are happening, which becomes. But, you know, then they do crazy things like that on Mission Impossible where, you know, they jump. They, they make the person think they're jumping forward into the future to you know solve their problem it's just like what is happening here this is so weird but yeah so it's all over the map it's you know again sometimes it's it's like you said it's we're stopping a thing from happening here we're fighting this crime here or we're you know interrogating this guy to have this happen or there's this possible supernatural ufo experience that's happening over here and we're gonna go take care of that as well you know it shows definitely all over the map that is for sure so Speaking of shows that are crazy <laughs> and yes. weird stuff, <laughs> perhaps we should talk about the Avengers. Oh, yes, definitely. Definitely. Well, I watched a couple episodes of this. Now, it was um, it was really, it was, again, I kept thinking I was going to be able to find stuff on YouTube for this one, but nope, not at all. Nothing on YouTube. Uh, there was one episode, so there are two episodes that I found on, on YouTube one of which was called The Frighteners, which is the first, uh, very first episode of The Avengers, which is uh, kind of neat. Well, I shouldn't say that, but it's one of the only surviving episodes of the first season of The Avengers. So one of the things that they didn't, weren't doing in those first few seasons, which includes getting into the second, second season when uh, Honor Blackman obviously comes onto the show, uh, was they weren't the bowlers and umbrellas yet. You know, it wasn't... Right that didn't really grow until the second or third season. So the first season was really more um, your general spy stories. So it's not until, you know, the beginning of, um... okay, here you go. So uh, during the Honor Blackman era, Steed was transformed for, from a rugged trench coat wearing agent into the stereotypical English gentleman, complete with Savile Row suit, bowler hat, and umbrella with, with clothes later designed by Pierre Card Cardone. Oh, I didn't know that. Uh, the bowler and umbrella were soon uh, changed to be full of tricks, including a sword hidden in the umbrella handle and a steel plate concealed in his bowler hat. These items were referred to... This is really fun. These items were referred to in the French, German, and Polish titles of the series, which were 
the French the French title translates as bowler hat and leather, leather boots. <laughs> Thought that's a good title for the Avengers. The second one is with umbrella, charm, and bowler hat. And then the third one is a revolver and a bowler hat. That was the German title. So, of course, uh, Honor Black for uh, two years, uh, she actually helped grow the show. Uh, everybody liked, you know, Steed coming in as like the main guy with the, uh, you know, the hot agent on the side who was helping out, who wore a lot of like skin type uh, agenty uh, uh, clothes. But uh, of course, she leaves the show because she gets cast in a James Bond movie, Goldfinger, where she goes on to play Pussy Galore. So next, of course, they bring in uh, Diana Rigg, of course, who is also goes on to become a Bond girl and leaves the show because of it. But uh, she's on for a good three years. Also happening at this time was that um, the show gets sold to uh, ABC, the American Broadcasting Company, for a unheard of sum of $2 million for the first 26 episodes. So that's a big deal they make with American television at the time. This also makes it real easy for them to actually film on film. So those of you who have watched old episodes of Doctor Who or even old episodes of The Avengers or any of these old British shows, you'll know that a lot of times when they're filming outside, they're filming on film. But when they film inside, they're going to, to you know, video recorder. It becomes very obvious by the, the, not only just the film grain, but by the type of lighting and the type of shot that you get from the uh, from the from the video cameras. So it becomes pretty obvious. So it was really nice for them to be able to just shoot all in 35 millimeter for uh, these uh, episodes. So uh, it also meant too, um, in the middle of this, after the first year, Diana Rigg discovers that she's actually making less money. Here's a good me too moment for everyone. Is that Diana Rigg figures out that she's making less money than the cameraman. So, uh, she opts not to come back until she's making as much money as uh, old Patrick McNee is. And of course, thanks because of how popular the show is not only in Britain, but how popular the show is in America, obviously they concede and uh, give her the money that she is due. So uh, that's fun. So this is an interesting so, question for those kinds of situations, go ahead. right? So, you know, if, if that's happening, right. you know, season four, season five, season six, that's a plausible kind of an argument to make, right? But the only right. character who's with it basically the whole run is Steve. So, like, what, what do you do, like, season 12, in which he's been doing this forever? Obviously, he's kind of an anchor to the show, and, like, you're the new cast member. No matter who right. you are, right? Makes a lot less sense well, than Tara King, who comes right. on after uh, Diana Rigg. Well, so in that case, obviously, because he's Patrick McNee, you know what I mean? He's going to make, by then, he'll be able to, he's, you know, going to be able to pull more money than he. And besides, her, I, I don't know. I don't have enough information on it. I don't know what kind of a star she was before she comes onto the show. Right. But if she has any kind of cachet, then maybe she should get she would get the same amount of money as him. But if she doesn't, then clearly she's got to take whatever, not whatever yeah. they're going to pay her, but you know. But you know, it's also funny too, because you, as we've seen happen in very popular shows, Seinfeld, Friends, uh, as examples, where, you know, the first season, this is really smart, by the way. I don't know if you know this about Friends, but um, David Schwimmer was like actually the big, and Courtney Cox, were the big names coming into that show and everybody else was a bunch of nobodies and uh you know david schwimmer especially at that point was you know gaining a little bit of a movie career he did that movie the Paul Bear, and blah 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 but he was the one who went to everybody when it came to contract negotiations and says we just everybody needs to make the same amount of money we just need to make it that fair we're an ensemble let's just make sure that we're all gonna be making the same amount of money so whatever that first season was by the time they're in their 10th season and they're all making a million dollars an episode you know it almost be i mean as popular as the show was it probably is but how cost effective is it to keep that show going what all are right, they gonna yeah. want in season 11 you know especially by that time when jennifer aniston's got a you know movie yeah. career that's off and running matt leblanc was doing his bad monkey movies but even still is getting paid for those 
you know, it's like, how can you even keep that show going? So I'm sure Patrick McNee, also being a proper British gentleman, was probably not, you know, milking the BBC for all the money that he could possibly get from them either, you know. So here's, here's an interesting TV story. Yeah. Uh, you know, this week I was listening to you know, Rob Long talk about TV. Um, he did not yet at that point realize that um, his show um, was going to be canceled, which it has been. Uh -huh. But he was talking about another show that um, got canceled, even though it did better than expected. Right? Oh, interesting. And so the other guy was like, why would it be canceled if it's doing so well? And it's like, because the, the powers that be decide they've made their money, they're going to cash in their chips. The, the only thing that can happen in the future is that prices of everything go up and there's no guarantee that you're ever going to make back this next piece of money. Right. So better to just, you know, call it a day. You've made enough episodes to syndicate it, to sell it as a syndicatable show, and then just walk away. Yep. You know, and it's a business, right? I mean, yep. that's the... That's the sad part of, uh, you know, not only just the movie business and the, but the TV business. And even, you know, when it comes to the Broadway shows, too, you know, it's like if suddenly they're not selling as many seats, if suddenly they're not making the money that they were making, it's like, well, let's close it up before we lose before we lose money, because uh, right. that's what's going to happen. You know, yeah, so, at some point, that's what will happen is that no one will come. Yep. And you're still paying for everything. Uh, I don't want to spend a million hours on the Avengers. It was, uh, again, one of those shows I I. I I have officially decided I am an Anglophile, mm -hmm. you know, uh, just all the British TV and other awesome British things that I enjoy, books and whatnot and plays. Uh, I'm clearly an Anglophile. Uh, growing up, I was watching, you know, it started with Doctor Who and Monty Python. Those are two huge things, you know, and then Douglas Adams. And then, you know, we start getting more and more into the British humor of Dave Allen and the two Ronnies and all of these other, you know, crazy British things that are uh, happening. And I'm just like eating them up. So then the Avengers comes on TV and I start watching the Avengers and I'm like, this show's really cool. It's got an awesome theme song, you know? So, uh, so, and here's what, you know, so finally watching a couple episodes again last night, like I did, I realized that what I always loved the first half hour of the episode. Mm -hmm. And then the second episode would be the times when I'd sort of glaze over and not care as much, especially yeah. as a kid. But what I realized it was is like you had the first, you had your opening scene, which was the problem or the mystery or whatever was happening, right? You'd find your dead body or it was kind of like a- How about this? So like, uh, you know, I, I've got three episodes and the first one starts like a man will, uh, is collecting lobster bowls, right? He's right. You know, a fisherman of some kind. And this guy just walks out of the water you know, in a wetsuit, takes off his thing, greets him hello, walks on, and, and you're like, what the heck just, you know, what's going on here? Yeah, that was one of the episodes I was actually, I actually watched last night was that episode. So at least you'll <laughs> know what I'm talking about. So that's nice. Yeah. Uh, but yeah, I mean, exactly. Uh, I, X-Files is a show that does that. Oh, Law and Order, even, you know what I mean? Where you have the opening, which sets up the rest of the show. Um, so then, and then you get the awesome opening theme song. Dun, 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 dun. And then you get what was to me always the best scene in the show was, you know, Peel and Steed, you know, having their like... Doing whatever weird thing they're doing together. Yeah, 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 exactly. Like at the beginning of that episode where they're like, you know, ch -ch -ch, they're sword fighting with each other in Peel's apartment, you know, and then he gets the cream and he starts like, you know, drinking his tea all the while saying like, basically saying we got a mission, so let's go, you know. But always, yeah, so they're always up to something fun, something weird happening. And then they're on the train and he, he's got the whole like tea setup happening in his in this suitcase of his where it's literally brewing tea and he's got cakes and, you know, everything that's happening. So that's what's that was always to me the fun about the show is watching those two interact and blah, blah, blah. And then, you know, the mystery unfolds and we find out what's really going on, which in that case was they end up in a town where... Nobody lives in the town anymore. People are disappearing. People who go there don't come back. And then, you know, it's like, are people strangely disappearing? Are there ghosts involved? You know, what's happening? No, in the end, we find out 
even more surprisingly and oddly that you know it's uh they're using this small town some foreign country is using this small town as a you know place to take over all of england you know in their attempt to take over all of england so that's funny you know and again that's how they all are you know there was an episode uh in season six which has uh speaking of christopher lee in it right it turns out that they like this guy gets killed but then he gets killed again and then like this, this the corpse keeps moving you know like they keep finding it in all these different places and it turns out that it's this guy christopher lee with which with by the name frank and stone frank and stone right he's created a robot that looks just like him and then at the end of it they you know they got to know which one do you shoot and it's the whole like you know which one's real which one isn't fake and blah 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 so again it sounds like it's this supernatural plot of are people disappearing this you know this body keeps moving around and whatnot and and at the end of it it turns out oh it's this explanation which is just as weird and fantastical but also slightly more plausible as opposed to like oh it's a ghost that's what's kind of fun and weird about the show you know the 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 relationship between between peel and and gail who honor blackman the the steed and peel and uh steed and uh tara king you know it's like it's the fun interaction between those two and then how they go on to solve said mystery in uh you know between the two of them which is fun also side note which i think is really cool is is that uh uh patrick mcnee and and uh and uh diana rigg remain friends for their entire lives obviously diana rigg's still alive she's on game of thrones as most people know now but uh you know patrick mcnee passed away uh i think in the early either the late 90s or the early 2000s but kind of neat that they were just friends you know you can just imagine you know like walking through some kind of like coffee place in london and there's steed and peel still sitting there <laughs> next to each other <laughs> kind of amazing kind of amazing don't think i got anything else in there oh except for one other great episode two that I, I this one i just saw the description on but where they end up going back in time to like greek you know the greek era and you're like how does these how do these things happen on this show it's so crazy but uh, that's what's fun about the avengers so it's another one that i highly recommend also happening at the same time as uh we're discussing trek and everything else uh anything else about the avengers you want to hit they uh, both did a uh, bond films Patrick oh, and, uh, very good. Yes. I forgot yeah. to mention that Diana Rigg, who goes on to become Tracy Bond and uh, spoiler alert, bad things happen to her. And as well, uh, Patrick McNee, who was in uh, View to a Kill. It's the one with Zoran. Yeah. Yeah. With Christopher Walken. Right. Right. Yeah. Yeah. That's a View to a Kill. Hey, I was right. I feel good about that. All right. So, uh, that's awesome. Anything else about 1966, 1967 you want to mention? Uh, 1967 was a good year. <laughs> <laughs> oh, well, you were born. I forget. That's right. <laughs> Not to date you, but uh, yes. It was funny. Actually, I was thinking of dating myself earlier because one thing I wanted to say was is that I remember when FM took over the airwaves, you know? FM then had stereo, blah, blah, blah. But if you recall, even back then, that uh, WLS then was AM 89 and they were still playing, yep. you know, music on uh, WLS, even though it was an AM station. And later now that, that's all talk now. Now you got WGN, WLS, they're the two big competing talk stations now still in uh, Chicago. So that's fun. Well, that wraps up our uh, pop culture extravaganza, I guess in uh from 1966 1967 all shows i highly recommend you go watch even if just for the fun and nostalgia of watching all of my three sons again the avengers is something i would highly recommend you can dig up a couple episodes on youtube however i also had to go to amazon prime and purchase an episode on uh, that one the, the biggest uh, so difficulty is in getting into the avengers now is you can't talk about it with anybody else because as soon as you say the avengers people are thinking marvel superheroes I don't even want to tell you how many times I was on YouTube trying to look up the Avengers with Emma Peel, and I kept coming across like, do you want to know what happens in Infinity War? <laughs> yeah. Five, five Easter eggs you missed in Infinity War. Yeah, so I, I, it was a long time into the Marvel series before someone would say the Avengers, and I wouldn't think, 
Steeden Peel? Yeah. Oh, no, you're talking about Hulk and, and Iron Man. Okay, wait, wait. Well, you know, something that we didn't even mention was the uh, the Uma Thurman, uh, yeah. Joseph Fiennes? Yeah, yeah. Yeah, and uh, somebody else is in that movie. But yeah, that, I forgot that movie. Uh, you know, it's fun. John Connery? It's, oh, yeah, he plays the, the bad villain. guy. Yeah. And right? Patrick McNee's in it, too. Yeah, Diana Rigg also has a cameo as well, I think. Mm-hmm. But, uh, you know, what's funny about that is that uh, at the time, that movie was really panned. But if you go and look at, like, I think I was looking on Amazon Prime, uh, it's got, like, three and a half stars. Like, it's mm-hmm. it's funny. I, I think people have come kind of come around on it now. Uh, well, I think, yeah, part of the thing is the Avengers were always a niche taste. Yeah. Right? And yeah, I just think it wasn't the kind of thing you could do a blockbuster with because too many people would go and go, I don't even understand it. Yeah, I don't even know what's happening. It's weird. Yeah. But, uh, yeah, so that's worth checking out, too, if you want to check out that show. Uh, Like I said, next week we're going to be doing Doctor Who, the Tenth Planet. Uh, So if you want to watch that, I highly recommend you uh, dig that up uh, somewhere on the Internet. Perfect example, too, of that videotape film thing that I was talking about. You can watch it in there. Also, perfect example of, you know, how people were stupid back in the day and erased (laughs) Uh, old shows because episode four of that uh, uh, episode is missing so they had to uh, animate it so uh, that's kind of cool but we'll talk about that more next week and then in two weeks we'll be doing Thunderball and then in three weeks I promise season two of Star Trek so uh, (laughs) we got all that to look forward to and more so uh, again as always thanks for joining us we appreciate you tuning in enjoying as we uh, indulge something other than Trek we Trek about something other than Trek uh, we get into the 1966, 1967 season. That's fun. As always, I'm Matt saying goodbye, and here's Ken saying goodbye. WBN, report my signals. Report my signals. Over. And we will check you all next week.